TTBM buddies, this is Ultimate 23 Dragon, and welcome to the series finale of Dragonite's Mailbag. Yes, I said series finale. Uh, here is the thing. The Dragonite's Mailbag series was originally not intended for my channel, but uh, my attempt of a co-op gaming channel with uh, me and my boyfriend, who you guys know as Kyogre20. Unfortunately, the channel never really took off. And because of other commitments outside of this community, we were never really able to fulfill anything associated with that. So Dragonite's Mailbag was transferred to my channel after I think maybe one or two episodes and continue on until this point. And the reason I am ceasing this series is mainly because... It's a Q&A session. Now I see why people only do like maybe two or three of these. Because you have to get the questions, answer the questions, edit them in, and all that kind of stuff. And the passion for making videos like this has gone down a lot over the years. It's got, it got to the point where I was making maybe two per year. And more often than not, it's usually the same questions, just in different aspects of different times. So that's why I uh, basically stopped in the Dragonite's Mailbag series. It was uh, pretty uh, interesting and fun for a little while, but the uh, fun level was just not there anymore. So that way, uh, this is basically going to be the finale for that. <clears throat> but we do have a long episode ahead of you guys. We got over 40 questions, so <laughs> let's have some fun with this. Welcome to the series finale of Dragonite's Mailbag. Let's get to it. What do you think of the Friends family selling NASCAR? Who do you think will be the next owners? Okay, <laughs> let's get something straight about this. I think the Friends family selling NASCAR is a bunch of phony baloney. And the reason for that is because I don't see them selling not before or after Brian Francis' DUI. So, here is what this mainly is to me. I don't think they're selling NASCAR per se. I think they're going to sell bits and pieces of it in terms of uh, getting money from outside sources. Like race teams have in the past when they merge or have parts of a team buy minority stake into this. That's what I think this is. And I've heard a bunch of weird ideas and stuff. They said that Comcast was going to buy it and all that stuff. It didn't know. It, it, they may buy into it, but I don't think they're going to sell. There, there's apparently some company in Atlanta that I think also has Formula One, uh, the American rights that they sold to ESPN and all that stuff. They were rumored to do it. No. Especially with a lot of people who are Atlanta Braves fans saying, no, that'd be horrible for the sport. I don't think the Franz family is selling. I think they're just going to sell, at the very least, probably maybe 49%-ish uh, of the stake or something like that, just so they keep the majority in other. They're not going to sell NASCAR flat out. <laughs> but I think, that's what the, I think that's what's going on here. Remember when Roush Fenway Racing became a thing? It wasn't keeping the Roush name, and then the Boston Red Sox were on the race team. No, it wasn't that. And that's what I think is going on here. So, <laughs> I don't think they're selling NASCAR. They're just selling bits of stakes of NASCAR. That's probably about it. And they're probably going to try and do it for money anyway, so... Why is Al Unser Jr. not one of my IndyCar favorites? <laughs> Probably because I was too young for his era. Uh, I know where this is going because Al Unser Jr. is a Vaveline master, and the longtime supposed assumption was if a driver is sponsored by McDonald's or Vaveline, they're automatically one of my guys. That was never true. <laughs> Okay, maybe McDonald's for bits and pieces of the late 90s, 2000s, yes, but not all the time. You don't see Jimmy McMurray in my intros, do you? Well, there you go. Or Kyle Larson. <laughs> and the same can be uh, said for this specific aspect of the Vaveline Masters. Uh, that was mainly a thing that associated with uh, 
drag racing and NASCAR, because they were the two major groups that got involved in that. There weren't many Vaveline drivers I actually remember. I didn't even know that Robbie Gordon was a Vaveline master in terms of uh, IndyCar until recently, when I saw a tweet by somebody. But the interesting thing about this is that I don't know much about Ellen Elmster Jr. in terms of his career when I was watching that specific part of the sport. The first ever driver I ever got interested in in IndyCar was Tony Kanaan. Guess why? And also keep in mind that <laughs> I remember, I don't know why I remember this. It was a race that Kanaan won when uh, I think it was Max Pappas ran out of fuel <laughs> and Kanaan won the race. It was in Benson World, no surprise. <laughs> and they barely beat Montoya because everyone's playing a fuel mileage game and Kanan paid it, played it best. But uh, as for Unser, I was really too young for uh, his era of racing because when I really started getting into the open wheel aspects of racing, I think he was either out of the, of the sport or winding down his career or something to that extent. So that's why he's not one of my uh, big up guys in terms of racing. How come I didn't do a 2018 NASCAR predictions video? <laughs> Simple. I suck at predictions. <laughs> I don't remember which year it was. It was either, I think it was either 2014 or 2015. Because I only did the predictions videos two years. Twice for NASCAR, one for WWE. And um, one of the videos, I think it was the 2014 prediction video, did not go well. <laughs> In fact, I think everything I predicted probably happened the next year. Because <laughs> I think I was, what, 10% right that one year? And that's probably the reason why. <laughs> and I also see the notice in the question. I, I don't remember because uh, I don't remember if I ever pronounced anyone's names or even tried to pronounce anyone's names. But apparently I got the last name for uh, the person asking this question wrong. Uh, if you look at the name, I would say that the name was Jeremy Isley. Uh, apparently, he wanted to correct me. It's Isley. Okay. <laughs> Glad to note that. But anyway, the predictions video, it didn't go the way it was supposed to. I actually haven't done one since 2015, I believe. So, <laughs> it wouldn't have worked out anyway. Did I watch Dragon Ball Z or Power Rangers as a kid? Yes, I did, actually. Uh, Dragon Ball Z, there's... How many versions of Dragon Ball... The Dragon Ball series are there? There's the original, there's Z, there's Z-Kai, there's Z-Super, there's the infamous GT, and maybe a couple others, I don't know, or something like that. There's like five to seven versions of Dragon Ball Z, but I did watch Dragon Ball Z for the most part. Dragon Ball Z was actually a, uh, interesting series for the most part, but you keep seeing the same things that you see with other variants. Like, I don't know why this is a thing, but in terms of anime-esque cartoons and stuff, it's like whenever there's multiple variants of the same thing, whatever the fourth version is, kills the series. You see it all the time with all these different variants. Now, I don't know if GT was the fourth variant or something, but well, I guess Super Saiyan 4 could count, but... GT killed Dragon Ball to me. I stopped watching after GT. The theme song was horrible, the music was horrendous, the storyline was stupid. This is, yeah. And Power Rangers had a similar problem, but it wasn't the fourth variant thing because they've had a lot of variants over the years. I think they just had their 25th anniversary or something. But the main problem that Power Rangers had was most of their series were home runs. They did have a couple oddballs that drove me away. Now, I know a lot of people are not going to agree with this, but Lost Galaxy was a horrible series. There was no point to the series. They started and ended their journey across the galaxy on the same planet. Huh? <laughs> uh, and there were a bunch of things that went wrong. Now, granted, one of them was because of a health issue. If you don't know that story, I advise you look it up. It's kind of complicated to explain here. 
But there were so many things that were eh, that it was pretty strange. But the Power Rangers series that drove me away from Power Rangers was Mystic Force. That was god-awful. Ugh. The theme song was horrible. The Zords were Uggsville. The morphing sequence was ridiculous. I don't even know why they extended the capes or anything. The storyline was horrible. The final battle was atrocious. Ugh. Mm. But they did have some great series. Like, my favorites are Wild Force, Lightspeed Rescue, Turbo. Uh, let's see. <laughs> well, th those are the big three to me, for certain reasons. And I think Wild Force is probably on top, because uh, they had great storylines and all that stuff. But, Mystic Force is the one that ruined it. And I really wish it didn't, because... <laughs> this actually goes back to a, uh, <laughs> this actually happened. Uh, back before, uh, all of my friends split up and went their own separate ways, uh, a long while back, <laughs> this actually happened. <laughs> uh, my buddy Greenlight, uh, one of the other Mirror Kids, who also likes both Dragon Ball Z and Power Rangers, but more Power Rangers than anything, I guess... We actually had a debate about this. There was a series called Operation Overdrive, which had the worst overall storyline of all time, give or take Lost Galaxy, but the best Red Ranger arc of all time. And the Red Ranger... <laughs> supposedly died in the series, but for those who don't know, he was an android. So they used a crown to revive him and make him a real guy. Okay? And that started, that actually started a debate. It actually goes further than that. We actually, I don't know why we decided to do this, but we decided to ask if there were any rangers that were killed in the show that weren't revived. And the answer is two. There was the Magna Defender, the original Magna Defender, and the original Red Ranger from SPD, Officer Tate for those who don't know. Those are the only two. Everyone else was killed and revived through strange circumstances. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, when the Operation Overdrive thing happened, we started actually having a debate over whether robots can technically die. Because robots can be revived or rebuilt or reincarnated in their own way or something. Humans, for the most part, cannot. Yes, there's organ donation and all that stuff, but... <laughs> And that's kind of a different deal, but robots can be rebuilt entirely as something else and all that stuff. But that started a strange debate that I still wonder about to this day. It was definitely one of our strangest things. That strangest arguments outside of anything NASCAR related. <laughs> but that was a pretty interesting time. But, yeah. I was into a Dragon Ball Z and Power Rangers for a bit. But both of them trailed off when horrendous series came in and ruined the series. For Dragon Ball, it was GT. For Power Rangers, it was Mystic Force. And that's kind of sad, because apparently one of the future ones after that RPM was pretty damn good. And I actually recently decided to listen to the theme songs for all of these series. <laughs> and RPM has a great theme song. I don't care what anyone says. <laughs> it's definitely different and unique. And worst theme song, no surprise, is either Mystic Force or Lost Galaxy. So, <laughs> since I'm the expert on worst everything, apparently. But still, I've gone on too long with this subject, so let's move on. Should NASCAR add a street course race? No. The, the main problem with street course races, for the most part, is that most of them are probably going to be too narrow. There are certain aspects of these kind of things that could work. I see that you listed St. Petersburg that could work, but there are certain areas that are just too narrow, and I don't think it would go that well. Toronto most certainly won't because of the bumps. And Long Beach is also too narrow in a lot of areas, especially that fountain area. And 
someone runs into that water fountain. <laughs> that would not work. Now, there are stock car-esque types of racing that do occur on a lot of these different things. Long Beach, for the longest time, had one of my favorite events to watch, the Toyota Pro Celebrity Race. <laughs> And uh, that can kind of work, but for the most part, 43 cars or 40 cars, or even a truck series with 30 to 32 trucks wouldn't work. That's why smaller fields are preferred for those types of uh, racetracks. So definitely not in NASCAR, and most certainly not for the Cup Series. So no. Unfortunately, I do not see NASCAR adding a street course. It would be amazing if they could find one that would work for their type of car and or truck, but I don't think there is one out there, unfortunately. Your thoughts on New Japan Pro Wrestling? I've never actually watched it because... <laughs> At uh, one of the jobs that I had, we had a TV and we could put it on sports stations and stuff. There was a station that actually has it, but our current, current setups do not get that station. In addition, we're pretty much stuck with all of the ones that are in North America, like WWE and Impact Wrestling and Ring of Honor when they're on. That's pretty much the ones that we have the ability to watch. Unfortunately, we don't have the ability to watch New Japan Pro Wrestling. But apparently it is a huge, huge thing because you're often hearing about stars from here going there. So I know it's a huge thing, but unfortunately, I have never really gotten the chance to watch it. But I've heard it's pretty good. Have I ever heard of Urinating Tree? He's probably the goat of sports YouTubers. I'm actually subscribed to him. <laughs> My boyfriend loves this guy. He loves his uh, sense of humor in terms of a lot of uh, interesting things. He loves Urinating Tree. And he's got a lot of funny videos. <laughs> oh, man. And every time he does one of those mini-movie ones, it's always uh, a very funny thing to uh, watch. I, I actually have videos relating to sports that I'm not really into. Like, there's a baseball one that he did with the, uh, what's the Minnesota team? The Twins? I think it's the Minnesota Twins, they're called. Where the, the Minnesota Twins had uh, the Curb Your Enthusiasm theme, and it ends with uh, them getting beat by the Yankees one, one time a couple of years ago. And it ends with the Price is Right's Loser Foghorn noise. <laughs> so that was uh, <laughs> pretty neat. They also, he also used the uh, Loser Foghorn noise again for one of the uh, NHL uh, free, agency, free agency events a while back, with a player by the name of Carey Price put two and two together. <laughs> and Easter egg, ahoy. Oh, boy. But anyway, he's definitely a very, very, very funny dude. Now, is he the goat of the sports YouTubers? That's a very debatable question. I, I would say he's in the running, but there could be other people, so... <laughs> we'll figure that one out soon enough, so. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> I'm subbed to him, and he's a cool dude. What do I think of Johanna Robbins, a.k.a. Johanna Long? A lot of people were really high up on Johanna Long. And the main reason for this is because she showed that in underdog equipment, she had a boatload of talent. But she fell under the same issues that a lot of racers, both male and female, have. Sponsorship woes, and all she basically got was either underdog equipment or guinea pig equipment. 
So I do believe that like other drivers, she she is a great driver, but she never really got that true opportunity with a top ride. Which is unfortunate because if she ever got top level non-guinea pig equipment, she could have been the one to show that female drivers are the it thing. Instead of being relegated to guinea pig equipment and basically getting thrashed every week like Danica was. And don't say she didn't have guinea pig equipment because you know better. You know Stuart Haas cared way more about Harvick than all their other drivers combined. But still, it's sad that Johanna and a lot of other female drivers never really got that big, big opportunity. Because, unfortunately, and realistically, I don't know if it's a blessing or a curse, because if she did get top equipment level ride, but it was guinea pig equipment, and then you guys would have said, oh, we thought she was the next big thing, but all she was was a flop. Ugh. Maybe it goes back to one of those things where it's better to fantasize about something instead of seeing it played out in reality and not the way you want it to. So, that might be a... Uh, that's pretty much an either or on that one. But I do believe that she is a good driver. But it's said that she never got the true opportunity that she and other drivers like her deserved. What is my opinion of Daniel Suarez? I think Suarez is pretty much a... Uh, a decent average driver. Um, I don't know if you guys would qualify him as a uh, money grubber ride or anything. One of those guys that has a big sponsor and that's it. Uh, it's pretty fortunate for him that he will get away from Joe Gibbs Racing before they try to corrupt him. And we're going to cover that later, believe it or not. But uh, Suarez is actually a decent party driver. Now, granted he got an Xfinity Championship, he probably shouldn't have won. But him winning the title was pretty historic, so credit for that. But with Carl Edwards' abrupt uh, leave of absence, that's not quite a retirement according to him, though I've seen no evidence otherwise. Uh, he was pretty much forced into the 19, and it looks like Gibbs has run out of patience in terms of trying to corrupt drivers. Because look how long it took him to corrupt Hamlin. I don't think he's going to wait that long to do it to Suarez either. And Suarez has already been bashed enough because of his nationality, which is dumb. He's here legally. There's no reason to bash him. Thank you. But uh, anyway, Suarez, I do believe, is a uh, decent driver that is not super... Top level, but not Uggsville either. So, right around average, if not just a tiny bit above it. Now, if Stuart Haas doesn't treat him like a freaking guinea pig, he may be able to win one or two races. But it will depend on how they feel about all of their other drivers. Harvick's going to be the top guy, still. Boyer's probably going to be second in command, so it's up to Stuart Haas to determine whether they're going to treat Suarez or Almarola like their guinea pig. And I'm banking on Suarez considering that Kurt Busch became the guinea pig after they finally got rid of Danica, so... Who knows where that can go from there. I hope that things will be better for Suarez, but with it being Stuart Haas, yeah, it's an upgrade from Gibbs in terms of possible treatment level, maybe... But, I really don't know at this point. It's either or. Now, remember when I told you that I keep getting, for a certain extent, the same questions again and again and again? This is one of them. Who do I think is going to win the Indy 500? And this is one of the usual things you see in the question. Will Marco break the curse? Will Power, Dixon, or Kanan win their second? Elio is fourth, or Ray Hall is first, or will it, or will it be an underdog winner? Uh, at this point, it's pretty much unpredictable to figure out who is going to win the Indy 500. Did you see last year's race? <laughs> there was at one point a possibility where three different underdogs could have won it. Now, granted, I knew that wasn't going to happen because of fuel mileage, but... <laughs> 
Oh, man, that Indy 500 last year, that was crazy. Especially with everyone wrecking out the exact same way for the most part. There were, like, what, nine cautions in that race, and seven of them were the exact same? Including both of my guys. And Reddit's driver. Uh, but who's going to win the Indy 500 in 2019? Hmm. At this rate, it's unpredictable to say who it is. So it's, it, to me, I still want to see Bourdais win it at least once so I can at least say that all three of my IndyCar trio have won the Indy 500. Because <laughs> fun fact, there is one race all three of the IndyCar trio have won. And it's not an IndyCar race. I'll let you guys guess that one. But anyway, <laughs> as for the Indy 500 this year, who wins? It's a toss-up. It could be any driver. And if Bourdais can't win it, I would love to see Stefan Wilson get another shot to win it. If J.R. Hildebrand is going to be in it, I'd love to see him get a shot to win it, considering that he lost because of Destiny. Thank you, Astro Phoenix. Don't ask. <laughs> but can I win a second? That'd be pretty cool, too. But among the trio, uh, the remaining trio members, actually, I would love to see Bourdais win it. The frig is what's going on outside over there? Someone vacuuming? Eh, okay. But anyway, uh, to me, if it's a big dog ride, it's going to be a Penske ride. I just don't know which one. I doubt it's going to be Power again, unless he gets lucky. But I would love to see an underdog win it. I'd really love to see an underdog win it. And among the underdogs... If they're going to be in it this year, either Stefan Wilson or J.R. Hildebrand. Otherwise, it's probably going to be a Penske guy, even though my heart wants to say Bourdais. So, who knows from here, so. <laughs>
Honestly, I don't care about the divisions of the manufacturer. For me, it's just the manufacturer itself. It's either a Toyota, Ford, or Chevy, or anything else that comes in. I don't care about the divisionary elements of the manufacturers. I don't care whether it's a Ford Mustang, or a Ford Taurus, or any of that stuff. I don't care whether it's a Chevy Camaro, or a Corvette, or all that stuff. And I'm definitely not going to be more interested in Toyota, because I don't know much about Toyota stuff other than Camry and Tundra. That's it. <laughs> That's all I really know about Toyota. So, uh, I really don't have much of an opinion regarding that says, oh, they're changing cars. Woohoo! <laughs> I've never been one who's been a part of the manufacturer wars because it's never been my thing. I know people aren't big with Toyota because they're not really American, which is funny because 70% of the parts of Toyota come from America compared to 30% for Ford, and that's been documented, so I never understood that argument. So, <laughs> that's why I'm not much into the manufacturer wars and all that stuff, so. <laughs> so, honestly, for me, it's a big whoop-de-doo. <laughs> Let's move on. Why do I hate Scott Dixon and Dario Franchitti? <laughs> uh, if my memory serves me correctly, this might have been from a previous Dragonite's mailbag. But anyway, uh, Franchitti, that's easy. <laughs> he has stolen a lot of events and maybe even championships from my guys in the past. Dario... This goes back to the guinea pig theory. Because <laughs> Scott Dixon has always been the priority driver of the Ganassi IndyCar team, with the possible exception of Dario Franchitti, and that was because that was Ganassi's way of apologizing for Franchitti for his ill-fated NASCAR career and injury because of it. But... <laughs> Dixon has become one of those types that not only is a priority driver... Which I get, but you range out against at least two-thirds of the IndyCar trio because of Dixon. And Dixon also infamously caused a crash that crashed out the two drivers I was rooting for in a race a few years ago, 2016. Uh, but I think it's because of Ganassi's affiliation with how he treated them compared to other drivers. And it's not just the IndyCar trio members that's raced for them either. It's all of the drivers that have raced for him, except those two. Basically, it's the priority driver theorem. And it's way more true than you guys could ever imagine. Let's care about these guys and no one else. Give me a break. True or false, Noah Gregson will fall into the Boosh Country curse and become a mega baddie because he's from Vegas. <laughs> By that logic, Spencer Gallagher would be a baddie, and he's not. <laughs> Noah Gregson has shown flashes of ugness, and a lot of people are very untrustworthy of him already. Because of all of the things that he has done. He said he's apologized for all of these things. But he keeps doing it again and again and again. And that's Kyle Busch territory. But look look who his truck series owner was. So, Ugh. I do see him becoming a baddie in the future. But mega baddie? I certainly hope not. But the reason being he's from Las Vegas? No. <laughs> There's a lot of reasons to hate on... Vegas, but not all of their drivers are mega buddies. Let me see something here, because I think Racing Reference has this kind of thing. Let me see how many uh, drivers are from Vegas. Okay. Let's see if I can find anything for this, because I want to look this up. Hang on. Uh. Nevadians named Nation's fifth worst drivers. That's literally the first thing to pop up with. <laughs> drivers are! Duh! <laughs> okay. Actually, I got a better idea. I know how to do it now. Hold up. Uh, let's see. 
Let's put in the site code thing for racing reference. And put in Nevada. See what I get. Because I think they do it by the state, not the city. Drivers from Nevada. All right. <laughs> Let's see how many of these guys I can find. All right. Drivers classified from Las Vegas, Nevada. How many do I find? Or how many do I not know? Okay, let's see. I don't know him. The TJ Bell, but he's from Sparks, Nevada. That's close enough. Aw, <laughs> oh, that's sad. I didn't know he was from Boosh Country. Wasn't he the guy who died in a car? That's May? I thought that was September. Hold up. Uh, the driver, by the way, I was looking at was Spencer Clark. Uh, in case you guys don't know that, I thought that I thought that was September. That, that might have been Charlie Bradbury because I got him in my spirit book. That might have been him I was thinking of. <laughs> Brendan gone, Batty, not Mega Batty. <laughs> Noah Gregson headed towards Batty territory. Spencer Gallagher on my good side, not because he's retired. Boosh Brothers, you know. Which is funny because Kurt Busch is actually a minor baddie now. He was close to Mega Baddie territory years ago. He was actually the top baddie for a while. Uh, let's see. I swear I know that name. Why do I know that name? Because he's ran a couple truck races. I don't know much about Casey Kingsland, but... Yeah. I knew I heard that name before. That's why I questioned that. Let's see, where are we at? Dylan Kwasniewski, I know him. He's not a baddie. David Lester? I'm not going to ask the obvious question because I know the answer to it. Steve Portingas from Nevada? Sparks Nevada, just like TJ Dumbbell. I always called him Portinga, but I think it's Portenga. But yeah, I know uh, Steve Portinga. Yeah. Yeah, he was mainly a truck series guy for the uh, early part of the 2000s, especially 2002, his main season. Along with 95, apparently, but, eh. I know the name, but I don't know much about him. I definitely did not know who was from Boosh Country. Let's see. Yeah, I, I know about Chris and Chuck Trickle. I know about their story. I did not know that Chuck was from Boosh Country. I thought he was also from Wisconsin and moved to Boosh Country. Much like uh, Dick Trickle's from Wisconsin and moved to North Carolina. I guess I was wrong on that one. But obviously those two aren't baddies either. And everyone else I do not know. So, there are some good guy drivers. Not many, but there are some good guy drivers that I am aware of. So, that does not mean that Noah Gregson will stay a good guy or become a bad guy. It's totally up to him, not history. <clears throat> I hope he doesn't become like his truck series owner, Kyle Busch, but so far he is showing bits and pieces that say he will, but hopefully he doesn't. Uh. <sighs> but, yeah. I did not know that Spencer Clark was from that area. Ugh. Actually, eh. But anyway, uh, let's move on to the next question. Before I make myself more sad. Is Steve Torrance a mega baddie? He is a neutral. Uh, he's been on the good side for a long while, but Steve Torrance is trying to become basically the bad side of Doug Coletta. He thinks he can do all of these things and basically insult the competition and get things done the way he wants to in an aggressive manner and all that stuff and thinks he's the king of everything when he's not. That's basically what I am perceiving to see from Steve Torrance. So that basically moved him to neutral territory. Now he's not mega doucheness in terms of what I have seen from Doug Coletta. So he's not a baddie. But I don't think Steve Torrance... There's, there's only two mega baddies in drag racing history, and none of them have raced top fuel, just so you know. <laughs> oh 
How many eggs do I have in this batch? Three. Now it's gonna be four. But anyway, uh, Torrance is not a mega baddie. I don't think he'll ever be a baddie. I most certainly hope not, because it's very difficult to become a baddie in drag racing. But still, <laughs> he's, he's not a baddie, and I don't think he'll become a mega baddie either. My thoughts on the current situation in the NBA. Do you think the NBA should be given the death penalty? <laughs> I honestly don't give a freakazoid about the NBA. Because the NBA <laughs> has always been garbageville. Because ever since LeBron James came into the league, the NBA has always tried to make it about him and no one else. That's why the Golden State Warriors exist now. <laughs> to stop the LeBron marathon. Because, at least in the earlier days, you had different stars that have been here and there. At least multiple stars. Today, all anyone wants to talk about is LeBron. It's why ESPN has become the LeBron James channel. Much like CNN has become the Hillary Clinton channel. Ugh. It's pathetic. It's very bad, and it's ridiculous. So, realistically, the NBA should have gotten the death penalty a long time ago by all of us. Uh, yeah. The NBA has been garbage, it'll always be garbage, and it doesn't really help. Because at least when Michael Jordan, who the vast majority say is the greatest of all time, was playing, at least you had other players that were talked about every so often. The NBA today, all they want to talk about is LeBron. That's it. And if anything happens to which LeBron's team loses, that's when they want to talk about literally everyone else. Especially someone by the name of J.R. Smith. Oh! LeBron's Cavaliers lost today. J.R. Smith is the reason. Let's spend 30 minutes on this program talking about that and not bring me LeBron whatsoever. Just, no. The NBA is not for me. <laughs> and it never will be. It should be the National Bleh Association. If, if LeBron had the nickname of Braun, then we can call, also, all, obviously call it the National Braun Association. But then people mix that up with Braun Strowman, and that would not be a good thing. Even though he's tall enough for the part, but still. Okay, now I'm just rambling. Next question. What is your favorite sitcom if you have one? I have two. Uh, one of them can be debated on whether it's a sitcom or not. It's called MASH. MASH is a uh, comedy drama-esque type show that's more comedy than anything that could be uh, classified as a sitcom. That's uh, That was around for 11 seasons. It existed in the 70s, in the early part of the 80s. It was one of the most hilarious shows to watch. And I did not know, because traditionally I hate war programming. Because all you see with war programming is documentaries and dumb movies and people dying and all that stuff. MASH changed the system. It made war shows more happy-ish. Because if you don't know what a MASH is, it's the mobile... Uh, I don't remember what its classification was. Mobile Army Surgical Hospital. I think that's what it's called. It was about uh, the nurses and the doctor, not necessarily uh, the soldiers or the soldiers dying. Now, there were some episodes where that was a thing, but it wasn't too many. <laughs> it was basically uh, a show about the doctors and the nurses and a mass unit. And it's one of the best shows of all time to me. And I never turn down an opportunity to watch Smash unless there's something else on that is more intriguing to me, which is not many things, but I've always enjoyed watching Smash. And the other one, more relatable to today's generation, uh, in terms of today's generation, my other favorite sitcom is The Big Bang Theory. Now, I'm going to show you something in uh, the bedroom. Uh, it, yeah, you can see it right there. I have a Bazinga poster. <laughs> So, yeah. I do have a uh, Big Bang Theory stuff. I also have some shirts over there, and I would have remembered to wear one of those shirts, because a couple of those are Sheldon phrases. Uh, Big Bang Theory also relates to something that you don't think would go together with comedy, and that would be science. Uh, 
that that is a very cool uh, show, and I hate that it's ending. I get why it's ending, but I really hate that that show is ending because there's plenty of ways that the show could have gone afterward. But uh, still, those two shows, Mash and The Big Bang Theory, those are the it sitcoms to me. <laughs> And I really enjoy both shows. No other sitcom compares. My thoughts on the Vegas Golden Knights miracle season. I want to be honest, I'm amazed they have a team to begin with. Because Boosh Country is only known for one sport, and that's auto racing with the Las Vegas Motor Speedway, which is on the outskirts of the city for the most part. But I am shocked they are getting sports teams. They got that UFC arena, that yeah, UFC arena thingy. Okay, that's a different story. But actual sports teams. Getting a hockey team, which by the way. Ice hockey with Vegas is one thing. But they also stole the Raiders. My football team. And now they've essentially became not Raiders, but traitors. Because of course they would start doing everything the wrong way. And I am shocked and appalled that Boosh Country did this well in their first season. And yes, I know they have Marc-Andre Fleury, but it takes more than a goalie to be an successful hockey team. And I'm surprised that those guys got to the finals in their first season. And what's worse is that a team that was cringeville for the longest time had to be the ones that saved the NHL from total mockery and all that stuff in the Washington Nationals. By the way, the home team for me... And the Vegas hype was so ridiculous, my boyfriend actually had the brilliant idea to get a freaking jersey of them! <laughs> I am shocked they got this far. <sighs> yeah... When, when the success started, I attributed it to, I attributed it to, okay, they don't have much data on the team, they don't know what to expect and all that stuff, and then it just kept going and going and going, and then I thought they were going to lose in the first or second round of the playoffs when they miraculously made it, and then it just kept going and going and going, and then when they beat Winnipeg, which is one of my boyfriend's favorite hockey teams, that's when I knew we were in trouble. Because Washington being the choke artist that they are, it was either going to be the choke artist home team or the newbie team from Yucko City winning the Stanley Cup. And th thank God the lesser of two evils won, but... Uh, <sighs> and Boosh Country won the first Stanley Cup final game. Yeah, Washington got the rest of them and won 4-1, but when they won that first game, I started losing all hope. Could you imagine the laughter the NHL would have gotten if Boosh Country in their first season would have won the Stanley Cup? It would make hockey a total mockery. And there'd be way more riots than just in Canada when they lose a Stanley Cup final every time. It would have been everywhere except Boosh Country. And it would have made the NHL look like a joke. I just want this nightmare to go away. And another thing, why are they called the Golden Knights? There's no correlation there. At least some teams you get an understanding as to why they're called that team. Washington with the Capitals. Okay, capital of the area. Detroit with the Red Wings. Okay, it's a tire with a wing on it. It looks like the Goodyear logo. That's cute. 
The Canadians with Montreal, they're from Canada, duh. But, uh, <sighs> San Jose with sharks, it's in California, they get shark things, and I get that. But Golden Knights? What, the, what was the point of the name? The most popular team name assumption would have been the Aces, at least with card games and gambling and all that stuff. That would at least make sense. Golden Knights, you're basically ripping off the Army College football team. Why? Everything about this has been a mess. And Boosh Country getting more and more of these sports teams. Ugh. And they also disgrace one of my favorite colors in gold. Ugh. This is making me depressed, too. Let's go to the next question. I'm surprised Mew Mew did not come in for that last question. I left the door open on purpose in case he wanted to interject, but... He's too busy with the uh, project that he was working on. So let's move on to the next question. Why were you not big with Kurt Angle? Uh, there's a couple different reasons. The main interest with wrestling with me really took off uh, during and after the Attitude Era. Because of my age, I could only really stay up for the first hour of Raw. Was it the first hour? No, it was the first hour of SmackDown, and I never watched Raw. Because my bedtime was always 9 o'clock. <laughs> For those who remember bedtimes. Yeah. Dang you, school. But uh, that's one of the big reasons, because Kurt Angle's uh, success peak was really around that time and era. But the other reason was his general manager era uh, back in 2004. Oh, God. 2004 was, an, uh, was a weird year. He had a great WrestleMania. The return of Dead Man Form Undertaker... And then things started going the wrong way. The worst pay-per-view of all time was the 2004 Great American Bash. And Kurt Angle was a part of this uh, anti-Eddie Guerrero thing. And he, over time, became my second favorite all time. Originally third, but then I started hating on Bautista. For reasons other than that, but yeah. But anyway... Uh, the Angle thing really self-destructed when it came to the 2004 Great American Bash. And, yes, Kurt is better as the general manager in terms of this decade, but, oh my, he was Uggsville towards 2004 and the mid-2000s. He really was. He got to the point I really couldn't get it with him as a wrestler. Now, yeah, he's good. One of the best ever, and probably one of the most underrated during the Attitude and Ruthless Aggression eras. But as a GM, oh man, uh, that ruined him for me. And yeah, he's doing better with uh, his current stick going on in 2018 and all that stuff, but that's about it. <sighs> what could have been, Kurt? But you decided to be one of those guys. Who are your guys in Formula E? <laughs> Actually, I don't have any guys in Formula E. Now, I have watched it. It's a very nice concept for motorsports with electric power and all that stuff. Very unique. That's very enjoyable. But in terms of uh, the drivers of Formula E, I really don't have an it guy. The only... Now, I do know uh, a lot of the guys. I know Nelson P.K. is in that series. That's pretty cool. He was a part of NASCAR at one point. Uh, let's see. I know the name Paul De La Rosa came up at some point. And there's a few others. Uh, not really uh, names that I recall or remember, but the one that I do remember from the original uh, bunch of drivers that were involved in this, and it's going to be funny to you, was actually Bruno Senna. And the only reason I remember that name is because my buddy Greenlight, uh, the only non-NASCAR non favorite driver he ever had was a Formula One racer Ayrton Senna. So, of course, Greenlight was going to watch out for him.
And uh, I did too, to a certain extent, because I knew that connection between uh, me and Greenlight. Uh, I don't think he's in that sport anymore, to the best of my knowledge. It's been a while since I've been able to uh, catch up on uh, Formula E and stuff. But, I guess if there was any driver that I ever kept my eyes on, it would have been PK and Senna. And that was about it. What is my opinion of the band Led Zeppelin? Uh, they were a pretty legendary band, I believe, in the 80s and all that stuff. I'm not necessarily big with them. I think there's only one song of theirs I've ever really liked, and that was Kashmir. But uh, that was about it. There were other bands that I was into in terms of the uh, older generations. Queen, Beach Boys, Turtles, those kinds of bands. But uh, Led Zeppelin really wasn't among that group. There's only one song of theirs that I was really into, and that's about it. So yeah, they're a legendary band, but it's not necessarily my cup of tea. What are your thoughts on Dale Jr. as an announcer on NBC? He's actually exceeding my expectations, because I wasn't exactly sure how this was going to work. Because I would figure him being the sociable type, it would, it would definitely be unique, but I think it would be something that the fans wouldn't necessarily gravitate to, because he would sound more like uh, an expert-ish fan, like if any of us YouTubian buddies did NASCAR, than if a regular plain old announcer did it. But... He's definitely proven his worth in terms of the broadcast. Now, now, granted, I could have done without slide job. I understand his reasoning for say, but Rick Ellen was not going to say slide job that many times in a row, dude. <laughs> but still, other than that, I think Dale Jr. is very enjoyable as an announcer. And I'm glad he loves it. Is this brilliant or blasphemy? There will be a NASCAR lockout in 2021. Blasphemy. Uh, here is something that is... Uh, here's something that extends NASCAR away from other forms of sports. With all the different forms of sports, they have some sort of union or players association that would help in that aspect. Now, you could say that the... Uh, Driver thing that's been going on could qualify as that, but it's really not. It's more of an advice thing for NASCAR to try and make the sport better in terms of them. And maybe by default the fans. It's not necessarily going to be the exact same way every time. And more often than not, NASCAR does not listen to them anyway. So that is the main thing in terms of that aspect. There's not going to be a NASCAR lockout in 2021. There's going to be too many sponsors getting involved, especially with the individual teams. And that's going to be the main thing surrounding that particular aspect. And the reason for this is because it's not just 30-something teams and their players. It's a bunch of different teams, and not only the drivers and the pit crews, but also the sponsors associated with not only NASCAR, but those particular teams as well. And NASCAR has gone all out over the years to make sure that there's no lockout in any way, shape, or form, and or boycotts and all that stuff. That even goes back to the 1960s with the infamous Talladega boycott and all that stuff. They still ran the race with substitute drivers, much like the NFL still played the games with substitute referees. Back when that was a thing. Huh. But still, uh, a NASCAR lockout, I don't think it's going to be a thing. It's much like the other question from earlier. I think it's a bunch of funny baloney. I think a NASCAR lockout is going to be funny baloney, and I think a NASCAR sale is going to be funny baloney. So... That's where I see that particular scenario going. It would be funny if it happened, but I don't think it's going to happen. For There's way more on the line in terms of NASCAR than other sports. And that's where I see that going.
What is my opinion on Alex Bowman? Uh, Bowman is in a similar uh, boat in my book to that of Suarez. Now, granted, Bowman's had way more time to get used to all of these uh, changes that have been going on with the Dale Earnhardt Jr. retirement and all that stuff. But the main thing there is that uh, Bowman's had plenty of time, but is he going to be prioritized like the other drivers? And honestly, I think the answer is no. Jimmy Johnson's never going to be a guinea pig. They can't afford to have Chase Elliott be a guinea pig, though it wouldn't surprise me if they actually did try that, even though it seems they're trying not to do it anymore. That's good. And I don't think William Byron's going to be their guinea pig because he is Uggsville in his own right. So if anyone at Hendrick is going to be the guinea pig like they did with Casey Kane a few years ago, it's probably going to be Alex Bowman, unfortunately. Even though he was Dale Jr.'s chosen driver because he was the sub when uh, Junior had his concussion ordeal and all that stuff. I do believe that Bowman is a good driver, and he has proven his worth in his time with the 88, especially a couple years back. But it'll totally depend on Hendrick where the direction of his part of the race team goes. And honestly, I'm kind of scared for him much like I am for Suarez. Because are they going to be treated as the drivers or as the guinea pigs? Time can only tell. But right now, I fear that he may be the new Hendrick guinea pig. But I guess time will tell, right? Even though you think he's a mega baddie, what do you think is Dale Earnhardt's best moment from his career? That's actually a good question. There's three different answers I can think of. His seventh championship in 1994, his Daytona 500 win in 1998, and his last win in 2000. Now, the seventh championship, that's obvious for obvious reasons. He tied Petty, and then they got tied by Johnson. He's one of the all-time greats because of his championship counts, even though in actuality he should have maybe six, not seven. 1990, hello. But still... Uh, that's uh, one of the notable things that happened with Earnhardt in his career. And then we had the 98-500 with either the best or second best call of Mike Joy's career. Uh, when he finally won the 500, even though he technically won it under caution, but it was still by one lap, so eh. And then is the answer I probably would have gone with. Uh, despite all of that stuff, and that would have been his last win at Talladega in 2000. Because it pretty much showed how much of a master he was in terms of restrictor plate racing. Because the way he went through the field, because I think it was uh, 18th to 1st in 6 laps, I think it was. It, it was pretty amazing. Now, granted, it, I felt like he was handed the win a little bit because of what Skinner and Junior did on the last lap to pretty much make Earnhardt, Funnybone, and Nemechek get away from all of them. And I don't think Funnybone and Nemechek were strong enough to get past Earnhardt at that point. But still, uh, the way that Earnhardt managed to master all that and not cause a wreck, which Earnhardt was known for a long part of his career, if not most of it, <laughs> that, was, that was pretty much an amazing deal. So, to me, his last win is his best moment. Now, granted, you could argue his 7th championship or his 98-500 win, but other than that, that's pretty much it. What are your thoughts on Laguna Sega returning to IndyCar in 2019? That's actually a good question. Laguna Sega, the, I, I'm, I'm sure most of you know this track already, is a uh, pretty interesting road course that is known for that uh, kink turn. But the main thing I think you should remember about that is that Laguna Sega was mainly known for carts scheduling, not Indy cars. So for them to go back to one of the cart tracks again, and especially with the new cars that they're going to have out, it will be very interesting to see how that can go. 
I'm not exactly sure how it will go, especially with the way the cars will look. But it definitely, it's definitely going to get interesting in terms of those cars. I'm just not exactly sure how the aspects of those cars with that track can go. But I guess we'll find out soon enough. I still wish they would add a couple of more uh, non-road courses to the schedule, but I guess we'll just have to find out in the future if that's going to be a thing. What are your thoughts on NASCAR doing restrictor plate tracks at every single track in 2019? <laughs> I am so glad I'm not the only one who noticed that. <laughs> NASCAR must really think their fans are stupid in order to say, we're going to put this new thing called a tapered spacer. We'll make the tracks and everything more exciting with more passing and close racing. It's a restrictor plate. Hello? <laughs> and the sad part is NASCAR did this once before, too. I don't remember if it was after Adam's death or Kenny's death in 2000, but... NASCAR had a brilliant idea for a quick fix. They put a restrictor plate on in one of the cup races at New Hampshire. I think it was the July race, so that would be after Kenny's death. And it didn't work because it just resulted in pure, ridiculous, bogus, boring racing in which Jeff Burden led every lap. Woohoo, that was a great fix. It, no, it wasn't. Ugh. It could work maybe for some tracks but i don't think it will in the overall aspect of this this is not a solution nascar is not listening to us once again what makes them think that restrictor plate racing is what we want why do you think i want if i was to do my own nascar schedule i would get rid of three quarters of the current restrictor plate races the only one i would not get rid of is the 500 and that's before that's for traditional purposes because NASCAR is not going to get rid of its baby. But the 400 and both Talladega races have to go. Restrictor plate racing is not the answer. And I know NASCAR knows that. So what makes them think that implementing the restrictor plate, um, oh, I'm sorry, tapered spacer on every race is going to work? It's not going to work! <sighs> if anything, all you're, all you're catering to is those idiot fans that made NASCAR look back in the 90s with those so-called fans who just watch auto racing for the crashes. That's who you're catering to. How is NASCAR not seeing this? I thought Brian Franz was out of power by now. CBS. I think this was in relation to a Dragonite's mailbag question from the last episode. And I, and I want to say this was from talking about if I had my ability to uh, change uh, what the networks would get. What, where, where would CBS fit into that line? That's what I'm guessing the question is. And the main reason that CBS basically cannot be exact Mundo featured is because of the scheduling conflicts it would have with the NFL. Because CBS has a lot of games going on with the NFL around uh, the end part of the season. So unless they want to be the beginning part of the season, like Fox is right now, then that would be the only way I would see CBS getting involved. And even then, they have other sporting events that they have to attend to. Uh, they got uh, golf commitments and other... Uh, low-level sports that they show on the national network sometimes. Even light model racing gets uh, featured on CBS t from time to time. They even had a three-hour program at one point, and that was uh, pretty amazing. But other than that, uh, CBS, it'd be totally up to them if they would want to get involved, but I don't see them getting involved in the near future, not even after the contracts are up. So uh, there's that.
with Martin Truex Jr. joining Joe Gibbs Racing, is he on his way to becoming a baddie? God, I hope not, but look how long it took them to finally corrupt Denny Hamlin once and for all. That's going to be my main fear on that aspect. And there were glimpses that showed that Truex could be baddie material, but when he went out with his little rage-out thing at Martinsville, at least he didn't go complete Kenseth at Homestead. Because he probably knows it would have taken him out of the championship. And then two mega baddies would have fought for the championship. And that would have been insta-evil for Truex. But still. <laughs> I'm still happy that the finishing order for the championship is exactly what I wanted. Because I'm hoping that NASCAR would finally fix their points. Since they haven't yet. Give them time. But maybe they'll finally go back to a legit points format. But as for Truex going to Gibbs, I am very worried about that. And maybe Gibbs forcing out Furniture Row was a part of their plan and all that stuff. But I really hope he does not get raged out. And either way, it looks like either he or Eric Jones is going to be the guinea pig for uh, Gibbs now. Now that Suarez is gone. So we'll see where all that goes from here. But... It's definitely going to be very nerve-wracking for the Truex fans to see if their driver turns bad. Or turns heel if you're a wrestling fan. So, it will be very nerve-wracking for everyone. Who takes over Daryl Walter's position from Fox when he retires? This is actually a good question because there's many different ways this could go. Uh, mainly, the way I see this going is that now that Jeff Gordon's taken over the driver analyst role, this would be a great time uh, when Waltrip does finally leave to bring Larry Mack back to the booth because he was the strong link of the Fox crew anyway. Literally, the only weakness that Larry Mack had is that he could not pronounce McMurray correctly. And now that McMurray is working with Fox, he now has no weaknesses. So, get Larry, get Larry McReynolds back into the booth. Jeff Hammond, uh, no, 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 no. Jeff Hammond is idiotville. No. He's not Waltrip idiot, but he's still an idiot. Yeah. And the other part of the question is, does anyone from NBC go to Fox? No. And the main reason for that is because I'm not sure if Fox is going to make a return. This is another point that I wanted to make. It's entirely possible that... Because Fox's motorsports coverage has waned a lot. They're getting rid of a lot of their stuff. They got rid of IMSA. They got rid of uh, the Supercross thing. Uh, NBC now has both of them. And really, all they have now is uh, NASCAR, mainly the truck series... Mainly what they have is NASCAR, the remnants of ARCA, a.k.a. nascar -ca, and uh, the NHRA, which was their decision, and the NHRA produces their own stuff anyway, using Fox equipment. So realistically, they only focused on a couple different motorsports, while another one uses their equipment and stuff. So it's pretty much a toss-up in terms of what they can do, in terms of motorsports stuff. And that's, it looks like they were trying to get out of the motorsports game. Yeah, they're trying to say, Oh, look at all these fancy graphics and stuff we're going to do with our new studio and stuff. You're still downgrading a bunch of stuff, dude. So, and you're actually getting rid of a lot of shows, too. I think they're getting rid of Race Day. They got rid of Victory Lane a long time ago, for the most part. But, um, yeah. It looks like Fox is finally shifting away from auto racing. And for the most part, that's a good thing because they were never a top-worthy network. They were worthy, but they weren't top-worthy like other variants of networks. And it didn't really help their cause the way they were doing the commentating and all that stuff compared to other networks. And finally, people are starting to see it that way, because they're finally starting to understand what people like me have been seeing over all these years. But the truth is, because originally I was going to say that 
if Waltrip retires, it'd be McMurray, but then you have Jeff Gordon, then you have two driver analysts. Now, yes, you have Jeff Burton and Dale Jr., but that was kind of a different circumstance because Jr. was not a part of the original group. And to me, it'd be Larry Mack if Fox continues. Because I got a sneaky hunch that if Fox does leave, and personally I hope they do because there's other networks that can do way better, then if Fox leaves... That's when Daryl retires. Now, granted, I don't know what the rest of that would actually mean. Now, if the rest of the Fox crew wants to go to NBC or the new network or all that stuff, I don't think Daryl goes with them. I think he leaves. And that's when you bring in either McReynolds or McMurray. Either way. Do I know anything about Haley Deegan? Uh, I'm here and there with Haley Deegan because I haven't been, uh, gotten the opportunity to watch much of her. The only reason I really know her is because of the Lucas Oil Off-Road Racing Series. She was a part of that for a little while. Uh, for those who don't know, and you probably should, she is the daughter of Brian Deegan, who is uh, also a part of that series for a long while. And uh, she's been advancing in her career. She recently transitioned to ARCA, and she's actually been doing uh, pretty decent uh, compared to other drivers and similar equipment. But um, I don't have much information to make a direct analysis about her. I know other people have been paying attention to her, and that's cool. I just hope she does not fall into the Johanna Long or Danica Patrick trap that other uh, female drivers have with... Uh, lesser-known equipment, or guinea pig equipment. A lot of people really have hope for her, but I've been down this road before being a female myself. I'm going to do the wait-and-see game instead of just insta-pressure her and all that stuff. So we'll go from there in terms of that particular subject. If NASCAR decides to get rid of the chase but still wants to try something new, how should the playoffs be determined and how to determine the champion? Okay, this is essentially NASCAR gives you the job to create a playoff system. Make it. <laughs> First of all, I would say no playoffs to begin with. But then they're going to go, like, we need to compete with the NFL and all that stuff. Then I'm just going to say, stop being the NFL. We don't need a playoff like they do. <laughs> and they say, we want a playoff. <laughs> Basically, NASCAR created this thing to begin with to reward people for winning races, right? And to make things more dramatic. Well, the easiest way to do off... To do off... To do all that is pretty simple. Make the wins the points. Because if the object of all of this is to basically win and be the best car throughout the entire race, then wouldn't the easy solution just to be the win is the point and the driver with the most points wins wouldn't that be the easy solution to all this and another easy way to incorporate all this is to feature a bunch of different racetracks not everything be 1.5 mile trioval type track you have different racetracks you got the regular circle ones like Martinsville you got the big tracks you got one 1.5 mile track you got a road course in there because isn't it the point of NASCAR doing this playoff thing just to determine who's the best of the best on a consistent basis? But if NASCAR doesn't want that way and they want to reward people for wins, just do it this way. The wins are the points. It would make 2011 way less controversial for everyone. Hmm, Tony Stewart had the most wins in this amount of time. Therefore, he is the champion in this particular aspect. Because the wins are the points. Bing! Problem solved. Wouldn't that be the easy solution anyway? I think Formula One had the idea to do this a few years ago, but they scrapped it for a new points format. But if NASCAR really wanted to do a playoff format and they really wanted to reward people for winning and not just performing, then wouldn't that be the solution? The person in the span amount of time with the most wins wins the championship, wouldn't that be the easy solution? Hello? But I'm still going to maintain 
We don't need a points format like that. We don't need a playoff. Okay? I'm still going to go by that aspect, but if NASCAR wants to do a playoff, then shouldn't the wins be and the points be the thing they're after? Because how long... I remember a Nothing Else Matters campaign a few years ago. I don't remember what year it was, but I think that was a thing a few years ago. I don't remember if it was a promo or a commercial or whatever, but th that was the thing. And if NASCAR wants to go back to that, then that's what they should go by. The wins are the points. You win the race, you get a point. Person with the most wins slash points wins, right? Shouldn't that be the common sense way for NASCAR to do this? Because logic? Because if the wins is what they want, then isn't that the solution they want? Makes sense to me. What are my thoughts on Martin Truex Jr. winning the championship? I loved it when he won the championship. <laughs> I really did. Because, let's face it, <laughs> there is no way that we were going to get into a position where this was going to work out any way other than that. Because Martin Truex was the it guy in 2017. Literally any other driver winning the championship, even one of my guys in Brad Keselowski, would have ruined that season. And people would have went on the tirade that they did in 2018 when Joey Logano won the championship. <laughs> so it was a very good thing that Truex won the championship that year. It was a good guy winning a championship for the first time since 2012. Everyone was happy that he won the championship, and especially under the circumstances that he did being the it guy and stopping the mega baddies, on both sides of the fence, those who think that Bush is a mega baddie and Harvick is a mega baddie, and even those rare few who think Keselowski is a mega baddie. But still, it was very good that Truex won the championship, and I'm very happy that he did. And... You were shiny, so... Still, uh, Truex winning the championship was a very good thing that did happen for NASCAR, and it's sad what's going on in terms of what the Ness expat if his career is going to be, because I don't think it's going to end well. And 2017 just might have been his best season ever. And I don't mean that in terms of a current thing. It might be an all-time thing. Because it will be interesting to see how this goes for him, but I don't see it getting any better than that. Who do you think should be IndyCar and NBC's play-by-play -play color analyst? Do you think that Townsend Bell and Paul Tracy will stay as the driver analyst? And who is the play-by-play? -play? That is a great question. I do believe that Townsend Bell and Paul Tracy will stay, especially now that this Paul Tracy weirdness has been resolved. Paul Tracy may be an idiot, but he's not racist. Come on, man. Even I can figure that out, and I hate him more than anyone else in motorsports. Use logic, people. But still, as for who's going to be the lead analyst, Lee Diffie, Kevin Lee, or Rick Allen, this is going to be very debatable in terms of a lot of things, because it could be either one of them. I honestly don't think it's going to be Kevin Lee, because I think he's going to be stuck with the ARCA duties that he is associated with. I don't think it's going to be Rick Allen because of his NASCAR duties and, if NBC wants to, his track and field duties if and when that time arises. So by default, I think it's going to be Lee Diffie. He's associated with that particular sport for a lot of years, for the longest time. And now that... Well, actually, that's another interesting scenario. Would he be a part of the IMSA stuff and all that stuff? Because he was associated with that too for the longest time when Speed had it. Well, they're bringing in A.J. Allmendinger, but I think they're going to have someone else in there, too, because IMSA might have some different people that they could adapt with. But anyway, I don't think that's going to be that big of a problem, 
So I think it's going to be Lee Diffie who's going to be the lead guy. Now, I know what some of you are going to say. What about Bestwick? <laughs> we'll get to that in a little bit. Who are your next-gen IndyCar trio? Okay, <laughs> this is kind of a funny one. This goes back to the fact that I said that I had a NASCAR dozen next generation, but here is something that I don't think many people realized. The NASCAR dozen next generation is just the children of the NASCAR dozen that is into racing. So Ryan Blaney, Chase Elliott, and Clark Houston would basically be the NASCAR dozen next generation. That's essentially what that is. <laughs> So, by logic, the IndyCar Trio next generation would be the uh, children in racing of Tony Kanaan, Dan Weldon, and Sebastian Bourdais. Now, talk about fusion of names. Uh, Sebastian Weldon, uh, Dan's oldest son, I know is in getting involved in racing right now, so he could be uh, potentially involved in that in the future. I don't know if Kanan or Bourdais' kids are going to get involved in racing, because I know they have kids. I just don't know if they're going to be involved in racing directly as a driver. But that's going to be uh, a long ways away, because I know they're all pretty young. So that's going to be a long way down the road. But for the most part, I don't have a uh, <laughs> IndyCar next, next Generation crew. <laughs> uh, that was a cute question. I did like that one, though. Oh, goody, it's now time to instigate some more ahem drama. What is your reaction to this video by Black Flags Matter? Now, if you type in that address, you're going to be led to the Bad Seasons Johnny Benson 1999 video. <laughs> I actually watched and commented on the video. This is basically the reaction that I had. And this is kind of funny, because I actually found out he was going to do some sort of video like this on Twitter. Because he actually posted a tweet saying that I was probably going to be triggered by his next upload. On Bill Elliott's birthday, nonetheless. So I knew it was going to be one of two things. Either a Johnny Benson's Bad Seasons video, or a Championship Seasons Kyle Busch 2015 video. It was going to be one of those two things, and it was the Benson option. And he went with 1999, which, for all intents and purposes, the Roush era was probably Johnny's worst era in NASCAR. But then again, the key word there is Roush. But still, <laughs> at least he picked the right era to do a Benson video on that particular subject. <laughs> at least he picked the right era. Uh, and what I loved about this is that there were people who were making a boatload of dumb comments related to me, and this is the funny part. In the common reaction series, that was one of the videos where I actually removed the comments. And it was because I did not want people trying to instigate drama and all that stuff between me and Black Flags Matter. Because we actually made up and got a better understanding of each other. But originally, the comments from that video was going to be featured. And then I decided otherwise because I don't want people starting more dumb drama and all that stuff. Or attempts at drama. Hint, it was never drama. Huh? But still, uh... <laughs> I like one person. <laughs> it's kind of a funny tweet. <laughs> we should bet on one of the excuses. First of all, it's a reason, not an excuse. And second of all, he said <laughs> he said the excuse was going to be everyone knows that Mark Martin had the best equipment of the Roush crew and Johnny was a guinea pig. Yeah, tell Jeff Burton that he actually had three times as many wins as Mark Martin in ninety nine. <laughs> are just hilarious. <laughs> and I just love how people thought I was going to blow up about that. <laughs> Newsflash, I did not. <laughs> so nice try. <laughs> At least he got the right era. <laughs> That's all I can say about that. Ah. <laughs> uh. 
I'm still waiting on the NASCAR bus David Stremme video, to be honest, but still. <laughs> What made me decide that my YouTube name would be Ultimate 23 Dragon? Well, this is going to go back into... Oh, yay, the heat came on. Uh, this is going to go back to how all of this got started. Because the honest truth is that I did not plan on having a YouTube channel until I got the internet on my own. But then things happened in college where one of the things I had to do in one of my college courses was video blogs on certain projects and all that stuff. It was from my ITP251 class, if you know anything about that particular type of deal. And uh, one of the things that we had to do was video blogs, and I just decided that I was going to start my channel right then and there, right? Because at least with college, at least I could do stuff on a computer and all that stuff. And originally, this goes back to the last movie as well, Originally, I did want the name of Ultimate Dragon 23. But at the time, there was someone who had uh, was doing wrestling videos, so I couldn't have that name. And uh, YouTube recommended that if I wanted a similar name, that Ultimate 23 Dragon was available. So that's what I decided on, and zoom, my career basically started with that. Uh, my channel got started on September 7th, 2011, because that's when the first video blog and all that stuff had to go up and all that stuff. And we had to use YouTube to do it because it was the easiest thing. And that's where everything got started. Because I've always wanted to do uh, a more sports video thing, because I thought it'd be cool. I did not know it was not unique at that time. I was actually one of the originals, if uh, you can call me that, since my channel was in the early 2010s. But... Basically, that's how all that got started. It was a college project thing that I had to do without many times. And, uh, in addition to that, the name I wanted was Taken. Because, uh, I've always, always been into dragons. And my favorite is the Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon from the Yu-Gi-Oh! series. That's the dragon you always see in the intros. <laughs> but, uh... More interestingly uh, than you could probably believe is that I actually was doing movies way before that. That's why a lot of my videos look really old. A lot of the movies were actually done in either 2009 with my older laptop to up at that point in 2011. And then I started doing new material and all that stuff. And then when my first computer finally went Uggsville, I started using the laptop, which is what I'm using right now for all of these things. So... In the end, it turned out to be uh, decent for the most part. There are some things that I've been in eh, with over the years, especially with NASCAR in 2015. Ugh. But it's been pretty good to me for the most part, even though there's a lot of things I would have changed, mainly how I associate with people and my understanding of people. That would be the main things that I would change the most over these years. But other than that, that's basically how the channel got started and why it's named the way it is. Does Alan Bestwick come back to NBC after his deal at ESPN is up, and does he steal the play-by-play -play role from Rick Allen for Cup? Oh, this is going to be fun. Because here is something I am not sure you guys know. Allegedly, Alan's deal with ESPN was up after the IndyCar part of ESPN's final season with IndyCar ended. And that was back in the beginning of June. But Alan has been involved with other things with ESPN since then. Most specifically, either tennis, golf, or college football. Mainly minor roles and all that stuff. So it looks like... ESPN didn't exact the Mundo released him, but reassigned him to the best of what I could find, especially with lower level stuff. So basically, if we don't notice, because let's face it, ESPN with motorsports is basically done. ESPN was severely pissed about what NASCAR did to them, going to an inferior network over both ESPN and TNT. And then they bring back NBC, which sealed the deal. And then when Drag Racing left them for Fox, so they could do their own stuff with Fox equipment, 
that's when they started giving up on all of that. Because NBC already had two-thirds of the IndyCar schedule television uh, roles in North America anyway. And that's basically where all this came up. And then when it was uh, heard that everyone at the uh, IndyCar and ESPN crew would be released, the question then became, would Alan Bessler go back to NBC? Now here's something I don't think many fans realized. Alan and NBC actually had a bad breakup the first time after the original deal in uh, the early 2000s. Because after the 2006 season, uh, NBC wanted out. And even before that, they were having problems with Bestwick. Now, for those who don't know, in 2004, September 2004, uh, Alan broke his leg in a hockey incident and Bill Weber took over. Now, Bill Weber is not the best announcer in the world. In fact, his era is probably the closest we ever got to Fox being the league network of that particular year. Alan's success beforehand is why they didn't do it. And then 2005, with uh, the Weber era, and even 2006 is the only time where Fox came close to being the superior network, but still never got there mainly because of the success values of Wally and Benny. But even with that, the main thing that happened is that Allen and NBC did not split on good terms. So I'm going to be honest here, I'm not sure Bestwick would be comfortable going back to NBC in any role. So we're probably stuck with Rick Allen for a while, and that's okay. Rick Allen is an okay announcer. He's not Jenkins or Bestwick territory, but he's not Weber and Dave Burns territory either. So that's basically where that is going to go. I do not believe that we're going to see Bestwick come back to NBC. That also goes back to a prior question. Like, if Fox leaves or if... <laughs> If there's a new network, what would happen with the lead role announcer? Because then you would go back to... Actually, one of my first Dragonair questionnaires, Joy or Bestwick? <laughs> and I would always go Bestwick for two reasons. First of all, he's better. Don't argue that. And second of all, Mike Joy is actually older. I did not know he was close to 70 years old. I had no clue Mike Joy was that old. And Bestwick, at the very least, is 10 years younger... Because he would turn 60 in 2021, so he's got plenty of time left if he wants to. So uh, that would be interesting to see how that could go in case there's going to be one or maybe more than one network to take over when Fox finally does leave like I believe they will. So that would be very very interesting to see where that can go once the TV contracts and all that stuff is up. And if anyone resigns, even if NASCAR is still around with all the stuff they're doing. Go back to that tapered spacer question. But still, uh, second part of the question. Should they replace Jeff Burden in the booth with Dale Jarrett, or should he replace Burden or Steve Letarte? Now, the main reason this is a thing is because Dale Jr. is already successful, and Jeff Burton has essentially become a yes-man in terms of ridiculousness. So, if anyone gets replaced in the booth or ditched from the booth, it's going to be Jeff Burton. Now, the question then becomes, will there be a four-man booth and they bring in someone else like Dale Jarrett, or will they go back to a three-man booth with Rick Allen, Steve Letarte, and Dale Jr.? I think it's going to be a three-man booth, because sometimes four-man is just too many. It won't work. It just won't. So that's the uh, reasoning with all of that stuff. I hope you guys learned something from this, because I'm not sure many people know about the Bestwick NBC thing. But uh, hopefully you guys did learn something about that, and why maybe Bestwick won't return unless it's with another network not named NBC. So we'll go from there in terms of all of this stuff. <sighs> I am so glad I answered that question. Do you know anything about the YouTuber Kamikaze Games? <laughs> I'm actually subscribed to him. That dude is so funny. <laughs> According to what I have seen on Reddit, we're apparently counterparts to each other. <laughs> 
he's done some of the funniest things I have ever seen. He had a similar, he had a worse meltdown than, he had a worse meltdown with the Logano Championship thing than I did with Bush in 2015. <laughs> that was one of the funniest things ever. <laughs> it was basically a rage quit. Uh, that was that was pretty funny. And I also love the fact, in case no one knows this, that both of us were featured in David Land's video. I was talking about Legato's championship. <laughs> we were featured in a brief intro. And that was pretty cool. <laughs> Look at now, car is over. Ah, <laughs> uh, and... and the stupid comments reaction videos, which was actually part of the inspiration for my own comments video. <laughs> that was pretty cool. <laughs> Those were pretty funny. He's got a connection with Sonic the Hedgehog, and most specifically Tails, like I do with uh, <laughs> Pokemon. And I know you guys haven't seen it a lot lately because the reason was nullified. And I see that you guys see the so-called rodent. By the way, not a rodent. <laughs> But for those who don't know, uh, Pokemon's also one of my things. And I don't know if you can see it from here, but you can clearly, clearly see the Ho-Oh doll uh, on top of the three cars of the big three of the NASCAR dozen that you can uh, see. That was a uh, feature in my videos for the longest time. That was basically my way of saying hello to my boyfriend because he actually got me that for my birthday slash Christmas one year. Even though it was two months apart, but that was a mailing issue, cur. But still, uh, we have that kind of connection. <laughs> and I actually saw one of the funniest videos I ever saw. I, I went back to a, uh, not Dragonite's Mail, but the comments videos. Uh, talking about Jeff Gordon is a dragon in other terms of salvation. Now, when I saw the thumbnail, I initially thought it was some sort of weird fanfic thing he was reacting to. Right, he was talking about Jeff Gordon is a dragon, and here comes this knight to save the day in the form of Brad Keselowski. No, it was something even dumber than that. <laughs> Because I do another thing from my comments video was someone saying there was a cringe to oblivion fan fiction website, and everyone thought it was me for some reason. <laughs> because, <laughs> and you guys think I'm a conspiracy theorist? <laughs> Go watch that Jeff Gordon is a dragon video, and you'll basically see one of the funniest videos ever. <laughs> the dude is funny. <laughs> and it also goes back to another video. <laughs> That I mentioned when he raged out against an AI version of Johnny Benson from NASCAR Thunder 2004. <laughs> As if Kyle Busch was driving his car. Which would make sense because Johnny's driven one of Kyle's trucks in the past in 2010 before Johnny left NASCAR for good. But still. <laughs> uh, I definitely recommend this dude. I definitely see why he has 30,000 subs. And the comments... Reactions video reminds me that he's basically the NASCAR version. I don't know how many of you guys know this guy. He's basically the NASCAR version of Alonzo Lerone. Now, Alonzo Lerone always acts to stupid tweets and comments and all that stuff, and he's pretty funny too. Kamikaze Games is like the NASCAR version of that. <laughs> now, I know he does other things too. He does Let's Plays, and he has the Cheese It Cup series, which I've seen a couple times. And that's pretty interesting. <laughs> anyway, a very enjoyable dude. <laughs> no, I don't think it's a counterpart to me, per se. Hint to you, Reddit. But still, <laughs> he's definitely a dude I definitely recommend subscribing to. I don't recommend many people because it basically sounds like a favoritism thing, but he's definitely, definitely one person. I'm glad I subscribed to him because he has some great content. <laughs> He's like the blue collar comedy tour all in one comedian. <laughs> that's how that's how cool he is. <laughs> I'm just ranting at this point. Let's move on. Okay, from a very funny subject to a very serious subject. Now, guys, I know you guys hate being serious in terms of this thing, but this is a serious topic, so I do want to cover that really quick. With two incidents in Pocono in the last four years, do you think it's time for IndyCar to scrap Pocono? My answer is no, but it's going to be for an interesting reason. 
I know what incidents he's talking about. He's talking about Justin Wilson's untimely death in 2015, as well as Robert Wicken's crazy crash in uh, 2018. Uh, the Justin Wilson thing was not caused by the track. It was a fluke deal that I still think should have been prevented at the very least four years prior to that when Weldon happened. Yes, I know many people think that the Weldon thing was going to be unsurvivable with or without the shield, but you would have thought that the cockpit shield... Okay, let's rephrase that again for people who don't get what I mean. Canopy! That's what a cockpit shield is, a canopy. Basically, if there was a canopy on the car, Justin Wilson would still be with us. That's not on the racetrack. That's on IndyCar for not being as safe as it should be for its drivers. The other thing about the Robert Wickens incident, and I don't understand the analogy here, uh, I was working when this particular incident took place, and my boyfriend told me that Robert Wickens was in a bad wreck that looked like Dan Weldon's wreck. So I was expecting something crazy serious and all that stuff, and... He was at least conscious. He was injured, but he was conscious, and all that stuff is good and stuff. But when I watched the replay of the wreck, it was interesting. The first wreck that came to my mind wasn't Dan Weldon's crash in Boosh Country. The first crash that came to my mind was Kenny Breck's Texas crash in 2003. And when I saw that crash and I made the comparison to Kenny Breck, I instantly knew at the very least that Robert Wickens would have some sort of back injury. And turns out I was right. I don't think it was to the extent of Breck from what I remember, but it did remind me of that. So it was kind of a freak out, but I understand why it was that kind of a freak out, especially if you're a newer fan and you don't have many memories of any season prior to 2006, if not before that. Did all the eggs hatch already? Yes, they did. <clears throat> but anyway, uh, that realistically is not on Pocono either because the injuries that happen with both Brack and Wickens are very similar. By that logic, Texas would have been taken off the schedule, and it still has not. Even though it probably should be, but I don't think it ever will be. The main thing about Pocono is that Pocono was actually designed for IndyCar more than any other series. That's mainly Pocono's main purpose. So I don't see IndyCar getting rid of Pocono anytime soon. It's the closest thing to a combination of a road course and an oval you're going to have. But still... I don't think either crash was attributed to the racetrack itself. It was more safety issues and all that stuff. I don't know what you're going to be able to do to prevent back injuries in terms of a car in the air landing on the hard surface of the racetrack at that point in time. And none of them are shiny. But the Wilson thing was definitely preventable, and still IndyCar has done nothing about it. And that frightens me that something is going to happen again. And I really hope it doesn't, but considering this pattern, it probably will. But is it on the racetrack? No. So I don't see them ditching Pocono for that particular type of reasoning. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the final question, and it's a very poignant one. I have given up on the sport. Why even bother watching? I'm going to be honest with you. I don't have an answer to that question. Because I guarantee you that all race fans, at least once in their lives, question why they watch auto racing. Now, it could be because of a point situation that did not go well, like NASCAR in 2015. It could have been because of a fatality, like IndyCar in 2011. It could be a number of reasons why you wonder why you watch auto racing. And honestly, I cannot answer that question for you. Because there have been times, like those two times, I wonder... 
Why do I still watch this? This is ridiculous. Racing's gone downhill. IndyCar can't get safety right. NASCAR can't get a points format right. The NHRA can't get plagiarism right. And before you ask, why is it everything that NASCAR does, the NHRA does? And sometimes it's even flip-flopped. Stupid points fixing controversy. Both of them had it. Dumb idea of a playoff. Both of them have it. <clears throat> Controversial champions. Both of them have it. Most specifically in the funny card division, believe it or not. But still, that's honestly a question. I've even asked that question myself. Because I really wanted to give up on racing after 2015 and all that bull crap with Kyle Busch. He is not the 2015 champion. No one acknowledges him as the 2015 champion. And it got to the point I boycotted NASCAR for a year. The only thing that pulled me back in was to see how bad NASCAR's stage format was going to fail. And for the most part, it has. <clears throat> yeah, 2017, the right guy won. But the problem is, if it doesn't really matter for the entire season, especially the end of the season... What the hell's the point of the format? It's NASCAR trying to be more gimmicky. It's like if you're trying to introduce... <clears throat> it's like if WWE had the Elimination Chamber pay-per-view, and the Elimination Chamber pay-per-view had the Elimination Chamber matches as the first two or three matches, and the rest of them is just one-on-one -on -one singles matches. What, what's the point? Also kind of reminds me of New Year's Resolution, uh... Revolution 2006, where you had this Elimination Chamber match, and there was one winner, and then it all gets negated by a freaking money in the bank scenario. Which means the Elimination Chamber match meant nothing. That's essentially what the chase for the championship is. <coughs> oh, I'm sorry. Playoff. We don't want to mix up the chase with Chase Elliott. Give me a break. But I honestly do not know the answer to this question. Why do we continue to watch? I guess it's because it's most people's favorite sport. I know it's been mine for the longest time. And there's a bunch of different racing formats that, if you're not into the big motorsports formats, there are other motorsports that can be way better. Stadium Super Trucks, Lucas Oil Off-Road Racing Series, the Torque Series every two years when it's on television. Uh, let's see. Drag racing where they don't have rain delays and Brainerd every freaking year. And dumb points controversies. IndyCar, if they can ever get safer and add less road courses and more ovals. Which is the exact opposite problem NASCAR has, but... Uh. But I honestly cannot... I can't answer that question for you. I really can't. Because... It's definitely something that every race fan has considered at least once in their lives. Why do we even bother watching this? I want to say the answer is the love of the sport, but what's there to love lately? Because everything hasn't really gone the way it's supposed to. And NASCAR's kept getting worse. IndyCar is not there in terms of safety. Drag racing, which just just wants to mimic everybody. It's just horrible. So I can't answer that question. Why do we continue to watch the sport? I guess it's because the other sports suck. I don't know. <laughs> The NFL's gone downhill. Baseball's boring as hell. The NBA is essentially the LeBron James League. <laughs> hmm. <clears throat> That's a very good question. Soccer is boring as freakazoid. Tennis is just little person ping pong. Then again, you could say that ping pong is big people tennis and all that stuff. And yeah. Either way, I honestly can't answer that question for you. I wish I could, but I can't. Um, that, that would be a good uh, finale for uh, you guys. Uh, what are your reasons for continuing to watch racing? And have there ever been points in your life where you just wanted to give up watching racing? 
That's actually a very good way to close out this video in this series. So thank you everyone for watching all these episodes of Dragon Knight's Mailbags. If you have any questions for me, just ask in the comment section below, and I'll just answer them right there, right there for you. Instead of having to wait another six months for one of these episodes to come out. So, <laughs> uh, sorry that I had to end the series, but I am really rethinking a lot of things in my life right now. And this one, I'm glad I came to this decision. And uh, hopefully everyone's had fun. I did not find my shiny. And if I do find my shiny, I'll let y'all know. <laughs> So, uh, thank you everyone for watching. Thank you for enjoying Dragonite's mailbag. This is Ultimate 23 Dragon, and that's my final answer.